Okay, and now we have confirmation from the voice in the cloud that the meeting is being recorded. With that, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, thanks to Peter McDermott and to Shantanu Mathur for kindly accepting our invitation to speak in this webinar. They're engaged in the front line of international development, devising strategies to deal with COVID for their respective institutions. Thanks for taking out the time. It's much appreciated by us here at uh, SOAS and by the uh, audience that has joined us from around the world. Uh, Peter is the head of global impacts of the of the global impacts department within the foreign commonwealth and development offices C19 directorate. You will be aware, of course, that DFID no longer exists and has kind of merged with the foreign and commonwealth office. Uh, Peter's taken up this role in May of 2020. Uh, the GID, uh, the global impact department's role, is to coordinate the UK government's international development strategy programming and response to COVID-19, working across departments and wider and the wider government. Uh, among his other tasks, uh, in, uh, you know, he's developing strategy and policy, briefing ministers, reporting on global impact of C-19 and risk management and evaluation. Prior to this, Peter was the deputy director of the stabilization unit, where he led a department of 60 country and thematic specialists, seconded from a range of government departments, um, to analyze the best practice on building stability, uh, on preventing conflict and meeting security challenges and to share their research, training and operational expertise across government and with international partners. Uh, he was the acting director of the stabilization unit from May to September of 2019. Before joining the stabilization unit in August 2016, Peter spent nine years overseas with the Department for International Development, uh, DFID, where he was posted to Pakistan, Zambia, and then Burma, where as country, as, as the Deputy DFID Country Director, he oversaw DFID's humanitarian programs, its work in the peace process, and its support to the landmark 2015 elections. He's also worked for several years in, at Her Majesty's Treasury, where he also worked on international development and conflict financing. Our second speaker, Shantanu Mathur, is the lead uh, advisor for global engagement and multilateral relations at IFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture and Development. Previously, he was a lead advisor to the Associate Vice President Program Management at IFAD. In these roles, he has also managed IFAD's engagement with the G20, the UN reforms, coordinated the UN, the UN Rome-based agency collaboration between IFAD, the FAO and the World Food Programme, and selected multilateral partnerships and platforms, including the Committee on World Food Security. He has previously uh, served as the head of the Quality Assurance Group at IFAD in the office of the President and the Vice President. As head of corporate grant of the Corporate Grant Secretariat, he managed the IFAD grant program for over 25 years. He has been a UN development practitioner for over 35 years, three at the FAO, and after that, for 32 years at IFAD in Rome. He has served as the co-chair of the Global Donor Fund for Rural Development 2016 to 2019. And he was the first consultative group for International Agricultural Research Fund Council Chair of the Evaluation and Impact Assessment Committee. He has served as vice chair of the CGIAR Finance Committee between 2001 and 2004, and the vice chair of the GFAR in 2017. Shantanu holds two master's degrees from Cambridge at Tripos and also from Delhi University. And he has contributed to or edited five books in the fields of rural development, research and impact assessment. So in, uh, for today, Peter will speak first, followed by Shantanu, and then we will open for questions. Uh, over to you, Peter, and uh, do let me know uh, when I should um, start sort of sharing your slides. Excellent. Um, many thanks, uh, Sabir, and uh, many thanks for the invitation uh, to speak here. Um, so I'll briefly cover our sense of the pandemic. Uh, just uh, we'll show a few slides about how the pandemic is going. Um, also talk about uh, the UK response uh, to that. Uh, and then I'll have some a few informal reflections about uh, what this might mean uh, for development more broadly. Uh, although. Uh, 
recognizing that it's really early stages. And it'd be also good to have time for a bit of discussion because I'd uh, very much uh, welcome your views on that uh, as well. Um, so as, as Sabir is saying, uh, I used to head up the DFID kind of COVID hub um, that uh, provided a coordination, a strategy coordination, kind of policy and briefing function for DFID's a COVID role. And we've now kind of rolled up into the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, from the start of September, which is the merger of the old Foreign and Commonwealth Office and um, UK uh, Department for International Development. Um, thanks for your patience. I shall be um, looking even a lot more shifty eyed than Subir because um, I had all this uh, on my work computer, but um, our sort of connection to Zoom isn't very good. So I'm doing this from my personal computer and I'll be looking over at uh, my work computer while all the materials are, are on. Um, but Sabir, I wonder if we could almost rattle through the first two slides, though just really uh, titles, and perhaps quickly go to the um, third slide and talk a bit about uh, the state of the pandemic. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm struggling to do that at the moment. Uh, please, yeah. yeah, so if you could just carry on for a minute and I'll just uh, admit a couple of people and uh, bring my tech support in, in to help me with that one there. Just a minute. So, please carry so on. just to say, I mean, the slides yeah. are by no means essential. It's just to give a bit of a visual, but actually I, uh, it's almost probably easier if I just uh, talk it through. Um, so, I mean, basically, I think the main message uh, uh, you know, from our perspective is that, um, you know, this is a compound and a protracted crisis, as well as a sort of urgent, uh, more immediate crisis. And I think the initial evidence we have so far is that it's going, the impact on kind of um, health, uh, economies, uh, stability in society is going to hit the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries um, the hardest. And so um, I think the third, uh, the third slide um, just gives you a, a broad sense of the state of the pandemic, uh, a kind of overview. Um, so we've hit uh, over 40 million cases, well over a million deaths. Um, again, just, you know, the sort of uh, pandemic uh, flips a bit between continents. But I mean, you've got Europe and the Americas uh, reporting the majority of new cases and new deaths in the last week. Um, uh, Europe kind of uh, obviously uh, rising sharply. Um, you've also got uh, this graphic of the kind of weekly deaths uh, per million population. Although again, I mean, a heavy caveat with that uh, is that obviously the data is very different uh, between the continents. Um, but I mean, basically, uh, until recently, actually, most of the fastest growing countries uh, in terms of cases were uh, countries, countries eligible for federal assistance. So, uh, countries. And then just a couple of statistics there. Um, we've got, you know, large number of people will be pushed into extreme poverty, um, anywhere between 80 odd and 150 million people, according to the World Bank. We've got a global recession uh, forecast. I think the um, the economic contraction for developing countries in aggregate, maybe a bit less, um, but actually the recovery, but per head of population uh, is probably a bit more. And the recovery in developing countries uh, because of sort of lack of re financial resilience is likely to be greater. So in terms of, uh, this is another slide giving you a bit of the pandemic. Uh, just giving you the highest countries sort of absolute deaths, sense of, sense of the percentage uh, weekly change. And you can see uh, in terms of that percentage weekly change, blobs of red in Africa, in sort of um, Europe on the borders of, borders of Asia, even in the Pacific. So you can see this is a very uh, wide ranging pandemic. And again, you can look at the, the, the sort of detail at your leisure. But if we go um, perhaps uh, to the um, uh, fifth slide, um, and this is uh, the kind of, I thought what, what's interesting here is that we've got a significant variation in reported cases uh, between different countries. 
Um, so we've picked out a t and also different regions. Um, so for example, you know, the pandemic uh, in terms of the recorded cases really raging across South America, um, less in Africa, although there's probably issues of data and under-reporting. And we've picked out uh, kind of an example of the apparent contrast uh, between India, which has seen a massive number of cases and has also seen uh, major secondary impacts of the pandemic, where we see that India has had an economic contraction quarter on quarter of over 20%. And then there's a forecast economic contraction for the year of between 8 and 10%, depending on uh, which forecast you believe. So really massive impact. And then Pakistan, which is the next door country, having far fewer recorded cases and deaths uh, per head of population. It's one of the few countries in the globe that isn't uh, e contracting economically, according to the latest figures. Um, and so the question is, uh, why is there this difference? And I think, uh, to be honest, we don't have the answer to that. And it's also worth noting that cases now on the rise in Pakistan and, you know, Pakistan Medical Authority is raising concerns about, um, you know, the, what the winter will hold. But we've just uh, noted a few points about why there might be these country variations. So demographics with youthful populations, uh, therefore less people at risk in terms of age. Pakistan is a little bit more youthful, for example, than India. The timing of implementation of disease suppression measures, so earlier is better if you can get in early. Then there's kind of what we're calling different subpopulation connectivity, but that's also partly about the social connections across social groups. And the more of those there are, that may well be good for social and cultural interaction and the economy, but it really accelerates uh, progress of the virus. And then kind of density of population, so these really um, concentrated urban areas, uh, more densely populated areas, obviously more at risk. Uh, geographic connectivity, um, especially between urban and rural areas. And in fact, uh, you know, India's locking down of um, uh, cities, preventing migrant workers working, but then not looking after them and not preventing them going back to their villages, uh, almost certainly accelerated the spread of the pandemic uh, around the country. Um, and then we've got, uh, you know, some other potential issues around, you know, social and occupational norms, uh, data weaknesses, etc. So if we go on to the um, next slide, um, again, I won't uh, uh, spend too much time on this, but um, this is really about uh, the variation sort of, uh, sort of between uh, within countries as, as well as uh, between countries. So in India, for example, we've got uh, more than 50% of the cases and more than 60% of the deaths reported in just uh, four states. Uh, and then, so you've got in a country like India, the variable factors across states. And then we've already talked about uh, the population movement to driving transition. So I just thought it's um, useful to get this sense of uh, the variation in the pandemic, um, just to note that when we're talking about the secondary impacts and the development impacts, it's not necessarily uh, one size fits all. Um, and we've really got to do the uh, kind of an underlying analysis, uh, country, not only country by country, but uh, region by region. So then if we come on to the um, next slide, uh, that's really where we're talking, uh, trying to summarise uh, some of the indirect uh, secondary impacts. So again, a, a very strong message that it's the indirect impacts that are greater than the direct impacts. So you've got you know, falling incomes, school closures, disrupted health services. Um, I mean, food and nutrition insecurity is a major issue. Uh, we'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, and also, uh, you know, vulnerable groups are disproportionately affected. Um, because they have uh, less resilience across a whole range of factors, whether it's, you know, health, um, savings uh, for the financial impacts, um, food and nutrition, and so on. 
The other interesting thing is that at a country level, we think there's increased potential for shocks and also for instability as COVID has compounded with existing vulnerabilities and contributed to increasing health risk, uh, economic exposure and social vulnerabilities. But often I think uh, the challenge is that COVID exacerbates and drives already existing vulnerabilities. So if we look at the debt burden uh, faced by uh, some developing countries, that was already rising uh, before COVID. And then obviously COVID exacerbates that. If we take uh, food and nutrition insecurity, UN is predicting uh, significant numbers of people with greater, uh, greater food insecurity and even the risk of famine in a small number of countries. But actually, the risk of famine in places like parts of Yemen, Burkina Faso, possibly North, uh, North Nigeria, um, the main drivers of that are kind of existing vulnerabilities, including conflict, insecurity, lack of access, and so on. Uh, and COVID is, is a sort of compounding factor that's pushing things over the edge. Probably isn't in itself the major factor, but it compounds with these other factors. And again, when we're thinking about the international development impacts of COVID, um, it isn't necessarily the case that COVID is the one big issue uh, driving some of these vulnerabilities. We've really got to think about, you know, how does it interact uh, with, with other vulnerabilities? And then you've got, you know, uh, I won't read out uh, all these examples of direct impacts, but I think that the purpose of this is to demonstrate the breadth uh, of the indirect impacts across the kind of, uh, across the development spectrum. So then if we go to the uh, next slide, um, we'll just, we've just got a couple more slides about uh, the UK government response. So if we go to the um, slide nine, I mean, here what we've tried to do is summarize you know the, the main the main UK response um, and this is the kind of uh, if you like the new programs that are focused uh, specifically on COVID um, so again I, I won't go to all of them but uh, some of them are around you know providing uh, resilience to vulnerable countries around the health and economic impacts um, and so on so a, a range of those we're putting a lot of money into research and development into vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Uh, and this is a good example also of where we're trying to uh, be global or international leaders. So it's pretty clear that uh, UK aid and UK programming alone is, is far from sufficient to deal with this, um, in a sense, to, to state the obvious. Uh, so if you look, uh, one of the biggest amounts we put in is uh, to what's called the COVAX AMC. And so that's the COVAX uh, advanced market commitment. Um, uh, and Spears very helpfully kind of picking that one out. So this is uh, for work to uh, produce and distribute a vaccine for COVID. And the advanced market commitment bit of it is that we're essentially saying uh, to the private sector, you know, if you produce a good vaccine, we'll guarantee uh, sort of purchasing of it. So it's a way of um, trying to incentivize people to produce things and distribute things for the developing world, um, where there might not be a sort of a ready market for that in terms of the money. Um, so this is money we put in to help that. So 250 million of that is we'll guarantee to put it in. What we've said is the second 250 uh, million uh, pounds will only put in if others uh, put in, as it were, more than that. So what we've said is we'll put in one pound for every four dollars that others commit. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of um, leverage that. And we're also then using the full convening power uh, of the UK government uh, to do that. Um, so it was a big uh, part of the prime minister's kind of speech at the UN and we ran a, a UN UNGA event uh, with the Foreign Secretary, our Foreign Secretary, and also others attended, for example, uh, Angela Merkel, um, you know, Bill Gates and others, uh, the World Bank. And there were a lot of then commitments uh, off the back of that. So it's really this sense of the UK doing programming, uh, you know, as sort of almost traditional DFID programming. Uh, but the U also the UK putting money into 
uh, international um, uh, efforts, uh, and then using the full UK convening power, whether it's senior diplomats, uh, which is an advantage of us coming together with the Foreign Office, uh, but also UK politicians, including the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, to really kind of try and show that global leadership, leverage others, um, you know, to, to, to contribute to this. Um, as an aside, the COVAX AMC was very interesting because that UNGA event, we did it um, as a coalition of the willing, if you like, without China, without the US, and indeed without the EU as an institution. Um, and I think two or three years ago, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have, have imagined that we would have a, a relative sort of diplomatic and development success uh, on quite a large scale without those players. That said, the money still falls well short of what's needed. So we'd kind of, we'd need to bring them in, I think. Um, and then if we just go to the last slide, um, so um, this is a bit more about uh, what we're going to do uh, or what, what we're doing, sorry, in the UK government response. So I think I've talked about the COVAX facility. Um, we, do do, we do deploy expertise to provide direct relief, so emergency medical teams. Um, and then, you know, we were talking about this being a compound and protracted crisis where the direct impacts far outweigh the direct impacts. So on food and nutrition, uh, Foreign Secretary has appointed Nick Dyer, who is our acting permanent secretary for DFID, as a very senior special envoy for Family Function and Humanitarian Affairs. Um, so he's sort of, and we've allocated money behind that as well. But again, you see his job is, is not really to spend the 190 million, that's more for sort of different program staff, but to leverage the kind of international community, provide that international leadership. And we've got um, the uh, money committed to Gavi over the next five years uh, on routine immunization, et cetera. Um, I mean, maybe if I just also offer some more, I don't know if I've got, if I'm at the end of my time, Sabir, or if I've got four, four, four minutes to go. And then, of course, you can come back later if there are things for you to say during the Q&A as well, Peter. So that, many thanks. So that's sort of perfect timing. So I, I won't take more than that. Yeah. But just kind of um, so some, some kind of thoughts as well going forward. So one thing we've tried to do is, is pick off particular areas for international leadership. So on the economic response, you know, working with and leveraging the IFIs on uh, the health response, where we think we've got expertise, including on vaccines, and then we're sort of leveraging our, our kind of international, um, the international community as well. Uh, so that's good. Um, and then on the on the international development more, more broadly, but particularly this. Uh, sort of famine prevention, food insecurity and humanitarian affairs. So picking some channels where we think uh, the UK can provide leadership. And then in terms of what it means for international development in the future, I mean, I think COVID is here for the short to medium term, because even if there is a vaccine, which is relatively effective, and that, by the way, definitely isn't a given, then it would take uh, potentially years to roll that out to developing countries, even with uh, a lot of funding and a lot of capacity uh, and so on. Um, so that's going to be, a, a, I think, a challenge, I think. Um, so that, that will be the uh, first point. Uh, the second point is, you know, how much do we need to do that is uh, very specifically COVID and how much of this is a sort of wider uh, response to these compound crises? In other words, doing what we were doing before, but even more of it. So I think I would put the um, oh, famine and the food prevention. Um, we seem to have some sort of interlocutor. Oh, the famine or the, or the food, um, you know, the, famine or the, the food uh, insecurity work is kind of doing uh, more than um, doing criminal work that we would do before, but kind of more so, uh, if that makes sense. Um, whereas I think the work on the vaccines is sort of new and different. It's uh, very specifically COVID. So it is worth noting we've also been, you know, reprioritizing a lot of our programs in the field as part of this sort of more mainstreaming of COVID. And then I think the secondary impacts will last um, for years, you know, sort of beyond, even if we got a vaccine, um, even if that were to be successful, uh, you know, the, the secondary impacts would last for a long time. So we'll have to deal with these kind of economic challenges 
uh, going forward, uh, et cetera. And then I think uh, another issue is, you know, does this change the balance between uh, short term and long term work? So I think, you know, given limited resources, we probably have to prioritize a bit more money on the kind of short term life saving work. Um, but obviously, we still want to prioritize and carry on uh, with the long term work as well. Um, so I think that that's an issue. And then uh, I suppose a final point would be, um, does this kind of contribute or again, drive or, or exacerbate or indeed um, reverse some of the geopolitical trends we've seen? So there's a bit of a kind of you could argue there's a bit of a geopolitical competition in terms of um, people positioning themselves as firstly being able to tackle COVID, but also to help other countries tackle COVID. And we see sort of Chinese, what, what's been billed as mass diplomacy, you know, as the Chinese try to drive that. I've talked about the COVAX and the sort of coalitions of the willing. So I think, again, that that's interesting. And also, whilst we face the challenges of greater nationalism and some countries that have a scepticism of the multilateral system, will uh, the challenges of dealing with COVID actually drive stronger international collaboration and a return to kind of multilateralism, as it were? Not, not that we've ever, not that people are necessarily turning away from it, but it, it seems to be um, challenging for some countries. You know, actually, there might even be positives that come out of COVID um, in the longer term even though those challenges uh, uh, in the medium term. So, so that would just be a few kind of thoughts. Um, but again, that's really to help discussion. Uh, and I definitely welcome uh, people's views on that. So is that, um, So I'll, I'll pause it there. Uh, yeah. And I think I'm out of time anyway. Thanks, Sibir. No, thanks very much, Peter. Uh, lots to talk about. And of course, uh, this is the first time I've had someone uh, bomb a Zoom meeting with... Uh, sort of unparliamentary video and uh, they've defaced your uh, slides here. So I'm just wondering, Shantanu, uh, since you're next, do you quickly want to see if you can share your slides from your computer since now you're a co-host? Yeah, can you can you just uh, quickly uh, check your, uh, whether you can... Uh... Could you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, so let me just see if I can. I have now changed and made you host. Okay, so let me quickly see if I can. If I shared my screen. Yeah, I mean I could do it uh, if you want me to. Uh, yeah, looks. Can you can you see yeah, my slide? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We can now share. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. So I I don't need it right now. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can say a few words before I come to the slide itself. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent, Peter, by the way. Uh, and I'll try and compliment you uh, with what I say. And of course, um, there will be uh, some parts where I might uh, even reiterate uh, some of what you said, which is important because we need to reinforce some of the messages. So thank you very much for, for having me here, uh, Subir. Uh, I was very much wishing that we had this conversation with all of you in, in person, um, face to face, and, and uh, in London, my favorite capital. But for now, I think uh, we have to, to make do uh, with this virtual modality, uh, signs of uh, the complex times that we are living in. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 uh, is having a dramatic impact on every aspect of our lives, um, and of course, work as well. So let me start uh, by recounting uh, some of the challenges that COVID-19 has thrown our way. First and foremost, I would say the devastating loss of human life itself. I think Peter alluded to it a little bit. The pandemic has totally overwhelmed our public health systems. He mentioned the 40 million people already um, affected, globally infected, and 1.1 million people who have already succumbed to the disease. So far, Apart from the extensive coverage that I see on, on the telly on, on the health crisis, 
we haven't heard much, uh, haven't heard that much, let's say, on the the food systems challenge uh, on on the news channels. But we know that that is looming, and I will come to that in a few moments. The economic and social disruption, I would say, is uh, caused by the pandemic is is truly disturbing. Let me focus a little bit on the on the world of work. It's an absolute turmoil. Millions of enterprises are facing nothing less than an existential threat. So many small and medium enterprises are actually disappearing. About half a billion jobs are gone. That's 500 million jobs are gone. Nearly half of the workers in the current 3.3 billion global workforce are at a list, risk of, of uh, losing their, their livelihoods. And about, well, tens of millions, let's say, of people are at a, at a risk of, of falling into extreme poverty. The number of hungry people, as we know currently, is estimated about at about 690 million. That's already such a shame, really. Now we know that this could increase by up to about 132 million by the end of the year. Now that's a total of about 820 million people who do not know where their next meal is coming from. Most of these people are going to bed hungry every day. And that includes about 3 million children who die from persistent hunger and chronic undernutrition every year. And that is absolutely unacceptable. And I'm not saying that all of the incremental 130 million hungry people figure, that figure is not an entirely attributable to, to the COVID-19 COVID alone, as Peter was also talking about. There are a lot of self-reinforcing factors here, which include conflicts, as Peter was mentioning, climate change, natural disasters, and economic shocks, all of which conspire together and confound the situation even more. And, and, and COVID-19 is, of course, an important glue in it all. Now I'm using statistics fresh out of the State of Food Security and Nutrition Report, the SOFI report, which uh, in 1920 is a flagship publication of the UN Rome-based agencies and sister agencies, UNICEF and WHO. Now, since I've used the term UN Rome-based agencies, I think it's a good way for me to briefly introduce to you where I work uh, in the Rome-based agencies and what we do before I can tell you how we are responding to the pandemic. So I wonder how many of you on the call are familiar with the 2030 agenda. Uh, the, the UN development system and the global partnership for development came together in 2015 and devised this 2030 agenda, which is composed of a spectrum of 17 SDGs, they call 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now here, what I'm gonna do is to share my screen. One moment. Can you, can you see what I have? Uh, yes, it's beginning to come up now. Yes, thanks very much. Let me put it on slideshow. I just wanted to show you this slide. Can you see all the 17 windows there? Um, yeah, that's right, I yeah. You can. So, so the Global Development Partnership that I was talking about and the UN Development System actually came together to develop a, a coherent agenda uh, they talked about 17 different goals, different thematic areas with something like 150 uh, different targets. Um, 
And basically, um, it is an interlinked and an interconnected and, and indivisible uh, set of goals, actually, where what we do in any of these areas does have a bearing on, on the other. So let me point, for instance, to SDG 10. This is a sustainable development goal on reduced inequality. I wanted to mark that in your heads because I'm going to refer to it later. So anything that we do there has a bearing on what's happening in the sustainable development goal number two, which is about zero hunger and sustainable development goal number one, which is about no poverty and leaving no one behind. Now, the UN Rome-based agencies, which comprise three different organizations, are actually a lead entity cluster that is responsible for the SDG2 on zero hunger. I'm going to stop sharing for a bit so that I can tell you a little bit about these three Rome-based agencies. The first that I'm going to talk about is the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, which was born in the aftermath of the World War II in 1945. It's an information and knowledge bank. It provides uh, evidence-based policy and technical advice to governments. It implements a wide range of uh, investment support activities a huge convening power and actually brings together sometimes 200 countries in the same room to get policy convergence on treaties, on standards, on, on normative instruments, for instance, and also provides agricultural based livelihood support in some humanitarian contexts. Now, this dovetails very well with the work of the World Food Program which you may have heard of a lot. It's been in the, in the news a lot recently. Uh, it's got the highly deserving Nobel Peace Prize for 2020. Now, it's the humanitarian organization dedicated to saving lives by delivering food assistance in emergencies. Now, WFP's efforts focus on emergency relief, rehabilitation, providing logistical services to the entire humanitarian community. And that includes UN humanitarian earth air service flights that they, that they have delivering food and staff as first responders, delivering them to the front lines of, of emergency. Now, I work with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, as we said earlier. And we are an international finance, financing institution. And we are the only one, in fact, in the UN system, which actually has a credit rating and, and engage with the capital markets. So a fully fledged international financial institution. And I must say, DFID is a very important donor to uh, EFAD as well. We work. Uh, with governments, uh, providing them with investment vehicles uh, and other development partners and provide loans and grants worth uh, somewhere in the region of about $1.5 billion annually. And all of this is, is really very sharply focused on inclusive uh, rural transformation, focusing very much on, on small scale producers, owners of very small and medium-sized rural businesses that employ uh, uh, very poor people, marginalized rural people, unemployed people. Um, we look at, you know, indigenous people, uh, marginalized people, women, the youth, disabled communities, et cetera, et cetera. So part of my job is actually to try and build and, 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 and um, uh, uh, um, look for complementarities between these three very vulnerable organizations 
and looking for collective engagement also with the UN development system as a whole, and all of those constituencies working in development, NGOs, civil society, private sector, etc. So while these Rome-based agencies have distinct mandates and governance structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are looking all the time for the opportunity space of working together and, and look for the bridge from humanitarian assistance to longer term development cooperation. And naturally, we are co collaborating together um, on the COVID-19 response as well. Let me go back and share my screen again. This time to focus on a couple of slides. Can you see my slides? Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet, no. No? I thought I was sharing them. Share screen. Can you see them now? Uh, yes, I think. Yes, we can. Okay. So really, I mean, the big issue here that Peter was also mentioning is how markets have actually collapsed. There's a huge disruption to supply chains that we are seeing here, reduced access to, to inputs. Um, services and, and the supply chain disruption is basically affecting the supply of food all the way from, from the production systems of smallholder farmers, uh, which is basically the farm, all the way to the fork. Uh, these are supply chains that include processors um, and, and other market act actors that actually deliver food. Uh, if you look at it, in fact, in many ways, even uh, urban dwellers, their food security is fully dependent on these rural uh, actors and, 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 and food suppliers who are extremely vulnerable. And, and they are actually using, losing their incomes and, and opportunities because of the disruption to, to supplies limits to the ability of markets to function have actually really uh, created a huge problem. I don't know why it keeps shifting. And what I want you to focus on is really in the Southeast corner here that the poor and the vulnerable are disproportionately affected. So our response here at, the, at this point in time comprises of, of four different pillars. We are trying to repurpose our current projects. They have already delivered a lot of benefits here. And what we're trying to do is to safeguard some of the benefits that smallholder farmers have already received. So repurposing some $1.5 billion worth of funds that are already locked up in ongoing projects. We've created a rural poor stimulus facility here, which um, is going to try and create a kind of a, 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 a rural sub-economy stimulus and a vibrancy there that can keep the value chains going. And we're going to try and create some enabling uh, environment of policy and institutions there also opening up some financial markets in the rural areas itself so that we can keep those uh, businesses going and keep them uh, solvent so that farmers can meet their immediate loan repayments and requirements there. So basically getting seed systems going there, sometimes trying, and pr trying to provide, for instance, biofortified seeds that can also help in nutritionally sensitive value chains there, helping with, you know, for instance, stunting and wasting of children, et cetera. So 
a nutritionally sensitive value chain that we are trying to put in place. Logistical support and storage, for instance, to avoid food losses along the way. Uh, a lot of infrastructural investment there in opening up uh, market access. Um, I talked about rural finance, which is extremely important, but also drawing very much on what we would consider the fourth industrial revolution, which is about also digitalization. We are mindful very much of the digital divide, but nowadays, uh, you know, you go to um, a village in India and you can actually um, buy a SIM card for your smartphone, uh, even if, you know, they don't have uh, proper sanitation systems in place there. So yes, there is a digital divide, but some of the digital solutions that we are trying to provide are actually working uh, at the farm level, giving farmers up-to-date information on production, on weather, on market prices, etc. So let me close here on my slide production app and give you a little bit, a few reflections there from what we're doing. Can you, am I out uh, already? Yeah, we can see you now. We can't see your slides anymore. I think you've shut off your uh, share screen successfully. That's great. Okay. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to really talk about is the fact that there is a huge unequal impact of what we are doing. I mean, the international development community, of course, is trying to galvanize some $14 billion to invest in these type of activities. But I can tell you that I, I am seeing, and we are seeing a lot of significant dent that's taking place in terms of the impact on, on, um, on uh, you know, uh, safeguarding our investments uh, uh, in the light of the impact of COVID-19. But I feel that no amount of money that we throw at the problem is going to help us address the problem unless and until we are able to squarely deal with the inequalities agenda in SDG 10 that I was talking about. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that although the pandemic has uh, you know, such a huge impact globally, it has an unequal impact on society. The virus, of course, uh, doesn't necessarily discriminate by itself, but fundamentally unequal societies exacerbate the impact on disadvantaged communities. So the downward spiral, or you know, that we were talking about, reinforces the structural inequalities in society, uh, which already exist in some sense. Uh, the majority of the rural poor, the vulnerable that we are talking about lack social protection, they lack, they lack access to quality healthcare, they have lost access to productive, you know, productive assets, many have lost their incomes, they can't even feed their families anymore. And we're trying to prop that through our programs, and trying to maintain their daily or monthly wages because without that, that means they have no food and at best, at least less food or even less nutritious food and um, access to, to uh, a balanced diet. On the other hand, the wealthier have access to savings that can tide over the lockdown and they're using that to tide over uh, you know, uh, the current period. They have also better access to treatment and options that can limit their exposure here. So these inequalities are often, you know, uh, 
in co coexistence, if you like, they're overlapping, they're interacting in many ways and creating severe compounded forms of de deprivation and, and disadvantages. And Peter was alluding to it as well. Small scale farmers are disproportionately at risk. They have limited as assets and savings as well. They, a number of them are actually older in age because a lot of the youth have actually left the rural areas. They've gone to the urban areas looking for better economic opportunities. So we are also talking of some disability linked to age there. Some of these smallholder farmers are actually farm laborers. They used to depend on remittances, for instance, uh, instance and all of that is, is disappearing because of the lockdown. And, uh, and, 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 and this means a lot of insufficient income to cover their basic needs and even to invest in farm inputs, et cetera. So on, on average, uh, I think a lot of people may not know this, but small scale farmers, ironically, are net purchasers of food. They are subsistence farmers, but they are net purchasers of food. And so any impact on food prices, et cetera, because of the market failure is going to negatively impact on them and conversely increase food prices are unlikely to flow back to the smallholder farmers anyway. So there's a particular concern that we have that the whole of EFAD's portfolio is at risk. We are going to continue to, to do the good work that we say we are, but we know that in about 83 of 101 countries that we work in, there are huge economic, uh, uh, disruptions there, which are likely to undermine uh, what we've done. And there'll be a huge erosion of development gains over the past 30 years that we've had. There are other things that I can talk about. Um, how much time do you think we have, Subir, or we can go into- You're sort of, you don't have any more time for your initial uh, 25 minutes. So if you- Oops, so that, sorry. Okay. Oh, no, Let's... Right. Uh, it's actually uh, well timed. But if you want to come back to something that you would like to bring up in response to a question, that would be great. Uh, yep. Do you want to take a couple sure. of minutes to just wind up your thing or do you want to just go? No, I'm absolutely fine. I would love to talk a little bit about the compounding factors of other adversities like the climate change okay. uh, and, uh, and, and other aspects. Conflicts are absolutely key. You know, okay. the vicious cycle of conflicts and, and, okay. and hunger. But okay, could, so, but, you know, I can start that. you off with that question. Please. Uh, just to the okay. audience, uh, thanks very much, uh, both to Peter and to Shantanu for a quite extensive uh, presentation managed in not very much time. Uh, it is very illuminating for us within the university setup to uh, get a view of what uh, those of you who are actively engaged in uh, dealing with COVID from an institutional point of view have uh, have to say. Uh, to those who want to ask questions, uh, obviously you can uh, raise your hand and that you can do by pressing on the chat function where it can basically have a uh, function of raising hands. Uh, otherwise, just put your question in the chat uh, and then you know we can uh, take it from there. So um, here, can I ask uh, both Peter and uh, Shantanu, in fact, exactly that question, which is, uh, you know, th there is uh, there are obvious uh, challenges with relation to food and perhaps some not so obvious ones that both of you have mentioned. Uh, but then exactly how do you sort of see your interventions with respect to COVID-19, uh, given the fact that we have at least several other overlapping problems uh, within which, which kind of provide the context within which uh, COVID-19 has to be approached. You mentioned, uh, co you know, uh, climate change, uh, long-standing conflicts that seem difficult to, uh, you know, which will continue whether or not COVID is, is playing out. Uh, so in, in some ways, they are kind of a structuring context for all of this. And, uh, you know, third, uh, we are kind of in a kind of global geopolitical scenario of uh, enhanced nationalism. And in fact, in country after country, 
uh, questions concerning science or data, uh, how reliable is government data that we often need in order for us to think in terms of proper policy interventions. Um, how do you respond to that? And if you could be, can I ask both of you to address that question? Uh, there are other questions which are coming up in the chat, which I'll take up after, after you respond. So uh, do you want me to take on a couple of things uh, in the context of uh, the adversities of climate change, maybe, and then yeah, you, you uh, take maybe maybe Peter Peter yeah. can yeah, can compliment me on 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 the government data, etc., which is which is a key thing really. So, of course, we cannot blame COVID nineteen for all our woes, and we've been saying that. And even before the pandemic pandemic came upon us, we were already facing huge adversities of climate change, and and we were actually dealing with a lot of this as. Uh, um, one would say, you know, the hotter um, uh, and, and more variable and drier uh, climatic conditions um, uh, are coming on. Uh, you know, farmers are having a huge problem in making their investment decisions, whether they should even sow their seeds, um, how much are they going to invest in input systems, etc. if they're go to face crop failure at the end of it, uh, just because, uh, you know, even a 1% increase, uh, an unseasonal increase in, 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 in temperature, a one degree centigrade increase in, in, in temperature can lead to a crop failure completely. So the unpredictability of weather patterns is going to really uh, create a huge problem for farmers. And, and that's where, um, the Rome-based agencies who deal with food and agriculture are coming in uh, and, and, and trying to uh, deal with um, not just the recovery from COVID, but, but, but uh, in rehabilitation work and also uh, building resilience um, at the farm level. So looking at um, a holistic approach, maybe a whole range of interventions that can improve the resilience of farmers, better, uh, more robust seeds, for instance, that can withstand drought. Um, and also building very much uh, on, on a whole range of, of uh, germplasm that can deal with it, farm management practices, building on indigenous knowledge systems also, uh, etc., uh, that have dealt with such uh, adversities in the past. The other one that you talked about is nationalism, conflict, etc. Uh, and here, uh, I would go back to the inequalities agenda again, which is actually at the root uh, of a lot of the conflicts that are taking place in countries like um, North northeastern Nigeria, for instance, in Mali, in Democratic Republic of, of, of Congo, in Somalia, Syria, Yemen, all over. Um, it's, it is actually um, the main driver of, of conflicts there, um, inequalities. And that is leading to um, uh, increased poverty and hunger. It's a vicious cycle there uh, for a lot of decades now. Uh, so conflict induced, migration is now becoming a, a huge issue. And uh, what we need to do is to try and see if we can go back to some of these uh, rural areas where, uh, you know, we can try and create a, a rural vibrancy, economic vibrancy, and rehabilitate those systems, and perhaps also address the, the uh, peace, humanitarian and, and uh, uh, development nexus, if you like, uh, if you like, and and actually, we can see that the COVID nineteen in in a very ironic way, uh, uh, it has, the fact that it has gripped a lot of southern Italy. We've actually seen that there's been uh, it has actually discouraged a tide of of human migration across the Mediterranean from from North Africa in the in the recent months. So, so there are lots of um, interconnectedness in, in all of this and a vicious cycle that we need to break uh, through our rural investment programs. 
Let me go to Peter. And... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Peter, would you like to come in? Sure, sure. Just a, a few quick thoughts. I mean, I think as a, concluding the presentation, I mean, the way COVID interacts with the other compounding factors it, is very interesting. And I think um, it's working out, you know, where, where are we having a, a specific COVID intervention? I think, which is the case where we're perhaps trying to develop a vaccine. But I think more often than not, we need to do the analysis to think of COVID, COVID as one kind of potentially exacerbating or driving factor, um, whether that's uh, within conflict, uh, let's say food and nutrition, um, those sorts of issues. Um, and so it, in some of those issues, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to shift or transform our approach, uh, but it may mean that we need to move with sort of greater urgency or in a different way um, to tackle the, the challenges um, there. And I mean, I think there's a lot of challenges on governance, you know, it also links to the disinformation point. But I think, you know, some governments are using this uh, as an opportunity um, to be more authoritarian, to clamp down on protests, that sort of thing. Um, this can then lead to distrust in, in government. And then there's the wider issues of disinformation, as you say. So, you know, the Russians, uh, for example, trying to discredit the AstraZeneca um, vaccine recently, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, obviously, we need to do what we can to rebut that. But equally, I mean, there are positives. So whatever the outcome of the US election, I mean, the US election is uh, settled in a few key battleground states where the polls are closer. There, there are millions of Americans who are, I suspect, moving, um, uh, changing their views because of um, how the current administration or president is seen to have engaged with the virus uh, and some of the statements made on, on, on that. Um, so I think we do see I mean, there is a, a greater premium, perhaps, on, on government competence, uh, that sort of thing. Um, go back to the point about uh, coalitions of the willing. So, I mean, again, we see this increase in nationalism, but I'm not convinced that will be the only outcome of this. So we've seen in other crises uh, that actually people come together and uh, that may be more multilateralism. And I think also some of the people working on climate change and building back better are a bit like the people who did the beverage report in the Second World War. You know, they're thinking of a, a great future. Uh, and I think um, I think that's really important. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll probably... Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably, uh, probably leave it there for now. Thanks. A couple of questions have come up. Uh, I think one specifically for Peter and perhaps the other one more specifically for Shantanu. Uh, one question for Peter is, uh, how does the new policy of merging DFID with the FCO impact DFID's response towards a crisis such as COVID? And uh, for instance, to an already existing country, country level DFID funded projects in Africa, uh, you know, how does that work out? Is it a disruption? Is it is it uh, an enablement of some sort? Exactly. How do you see that going on? And for Shantanu, your, your question after, uh, after Peter is, uh, what are your th thoughts on cash handouts for which the World Food Program has been, uh, has been one of the biggest actors instead of food and resources being handed out? Peter first, and then Shantanu, please. Yeah, so on, on DFID and FCO, I mean, I, I suppose the first comment is it's early days, so we're six weeks into the merger. Um, I don't think it, it, it undermines those programmes in sub-Saharan Africa, so the department remains committed to 0.7% and to spending that money in the best way possible. So I think that will, that will continue. Um, and our DFID offices uh, continue in sub-Saharan Africa uh, to deliver programs. And I thought that there'd be even greater premium on you know, value for money and doing that in the right way. Um, there are potential advantages, which I think we're already seeing in terms of um, getting that more coherence and stronger UK convening power. So I think there's a different psychology now in that, you know, people at the top of the Foreign Office, rather than seeing it as their role to help that other department over there with their objectives, almost in their spare time, if you like, you know, the, the development objectives of DFID are now at the heart of the new merged department and are the responsibility of 
the top managers, many of whom are the top diplomats, whether it's you know the top diplomat at the UN or the US ambassador and so on. And indeed, it is the responsibility of the foreign secretary uh, directly rather than, as it were, uh, indirectly. Um, so I think on our, I mean, I talked, I won't repeat about our, the money to raise for the COVAX AMC, where I think we got a lot of uh, that help. Um, I mean, the foreign secretary's day one announcement for the new FCDO was not a kind of diplomatic initiative or trade, you know, it was the 119 million uh, for COVID and famine, extra money to tackle that, and the appointment of the special envoy uh, for famine prevention uh, and humanitarian affairs. So I think there are uh, potentially opportunities. And then what we're working on, I mean, I'm former DFID, is really uh, aiming to keep a strong voice for development uh, in FCDO and to maintain the valuing of uh, development expertise. I mean, I think that that's really, really important. And that's really what we're, uh, what we're pushing on, I think, uh, yeah. Hello, Shantanu, do you want to take up your question on uh, yeah. uh, cash? Right. Uh, cash and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So when we deal with humanitarian assistance, you know, in an emergency, um, I think WFP's work is, is uh, absolutely phenomenal in, in the way they're able to actually provide what is required, uh, you know, to avoid hunger and, and hunger related deaths. So in the first instance, when they go with handouts, I mean, handouts can be a very bad word or dirty word, in fact. Um, but when you look at it uh, from a different perspective, this is extremely important as a, as a social protection uh, 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 measure in the first in instance, as a first response. So um, cash becomes important in the context of propping up the rural sub-economy. Um, so it's not a bad thing at all when you are actually trying to improve uh, the purchasing power of the disadvantaged people, um, people who've been hit badly, not just because of the health pandemic, but, but because of the socioeconomic fallout that has happened. So in the first instance, a cash handout can be a very useful one in terms of uh, driving up uh, a, a, a slacking or a sagging uh, rural sub-economy. Uh, but WFP has taken it to a, a different level now. They are, in fact, uh, dealing with, with cash in the form of contactless cards, for instance, which are important in the context of the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, not spreading infections, so those cards are contactless, you just go and you can purchase your daily rations or whatever, um, which is great really, and it's COVID friendly. So in the first instance, cash handouts, great, but you can't sustain that over a long period of time. You have to start thinking of graduating, uh, you know, uh, the, the target groups into becoming more self-sufficient uh, uh, players uh, in the rural economy. And that's what we're trying to do. So WFP dealing with really uh, affected uh, populations that really don't know where the next meal is coming from. And then with these cash, cash handouts, uh, slowly tapering off these subsidies so that organizations like EFAD can come and pick them up and graduate them into longer term, longer term self-sustained development. That's, that's the kind of, of strategy we should be looking at. Thanks, Peter and Shantanu. While we uh, are waiting for uh, more questions, can I just ask uh, maybe something that you might have some thoughts on, uh, which is that, you know, in many cases, sub-national units of government have done quite well, even where national governments and the country as a whole has probably not done as well. So from India, we have the example of uh, the state of Kerala, uh, which seems to be, you know, be, uh, to be talked up at the moment. Uh, but also, you know, if you look at uh, so-called slum areas of, of Mumbai, uh, and that goes back to the resilience of uh, uh, people who are poor and on the edge, 
that uh, slum areas uh, which were feared to, uh, you know, when the pandemic broke out in Mumbai, for example, uh, it, it, what the one major fear was that the poor would get very badly hit in, in, in massively densely populated slums like in Dharavi. Likewise for some Brazilian cities and so forth as well, but that has not been the case. So are there any lessons to be learned from subnational governmental units that can be spread into different parts of the world? Maybe generalizable is too strong a word, but what do we learn from the places within countries where there has been relatively successful intervention? Uh, West Africa, which seems to have done reasonably well in terms of dealing with the pandemic, and they say this is partly because of the infrastructure that was built for dealing with other localized epidemics and things of that sort. So do you have any thoughts on that, Peter and Shantanu, on subnational units of government? Uh, how does your, uh, how do your institutions deal with them and so forth? And by the way, uh, to the audience, please keep your questions coming. We have at least another 15 minutes before we think in terms of winding down. So that's a great question, Subir. Maybe I can uh, kick off and then Peter might wish to complement what I, what I would say. I personally, I wouldn't um, bet too much on, on, on the resilience of uh, human beings necessarily to the pandemic. I mean, that's not necessarily the reason why uh, some of these uh, slums that we're talking about, slum areas, really poor uh, areas, there's been some kind of resistance to the virus. It's not pr probably because of health resilience, but it's just you know, that they're probably lucky in not having been exposed to it. But there may be different opinions to that. There's no empirical evidence uh, saying why they have been somehow protected from the spread of the virus there. Um, to some extent, you did answer your question there, Subir, by saying, um, you know, it's a lot to do also with the capacity of local institutions and their ability to be able to work with, with local communities. Um, and, and that's the kind of resilience, perhaps, which has, which has helped more in terms of their not being afflicted with the virus as other parts of uh, the country and, and the world. So social institutions, extremely important. Um, and there have been some fantastic developments that have taken place in the past 30 to 40 years, local capacity development, local institutions, policy support, um, and the use of um, innovations, uh, both in institutional architecture, you know, more multi-stakeholder decision systems where uh, the communities themselves have a, a role in, in you know, decision making those kind of structures have really helped societies to somehow uh, become more resilient, um, uh, you know, galvanize their resources very quickly uh, as first responders within the community itself, not waiting for external help to arrive uh, uh, and arrive too late. So, this is one um, uh, conjecture that I can put forward. This is not empirically, uh, mm. uh, of yeah. course, uh, forward. But Peter might wish to compliment what I'm saying. Hello, Peter. I mean, I have very little to add. I mean, one thing is just uh, that, that that's something we're looking into and, and funding research on is this sort of variation, apparently, between regions uh, and, and uh, local areas. And I would agree with, uh, I think, Shantanu, uh, Shantanu has set out um, some of the hypotheses uh, very well. Uh, and I think more generally, you know, by having, um, by permitting local authorities to respond in different ways, um, it does allow you a bit of experimentation. And then you can, as long as you can bring that learning back, uh, I think it's good. I mean, I'm you know, not an expert on the UK domestic response, but we have these debates about, you know, localised uh, support for test and trace, and then you've got the devolved administrations doing different things, and it'll be interesting to see what's there. Uh, but I, I suspect the final conclusions may not come for a few months, uh, because it may also be that uh, there are further 
you know, waves into challenges to come. But I've also read about, I mean, the corridor example uh, does seem uh, very promising. Um, so there's probably a lot in that, yeah. Uh, you know, for the last set of questions, uh, unless more come out, uh, can I just ask, uh, let me put this on the table. A lot of what we talked about today and the questions that came uh, refer to the pandemic as it has existed so far. And of course, it is not over. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a fair bit of trepidation as to what the next few months hold as the weather conditions and, you know, they change. Uh, the benefits of clean air, you know, that one sort of heard about when the lockdown was very draconian in the initial months of the lockdown around the world. We can see in the cities, particularly of South Asia, the annual smog and things of that sort, uh, plummeting temperatures, conditions that we were told uh, you know, are by and large suitable for the virus to uh, reach its most deadly potential. Uh, of course, you know, we are also, I think the world as a whole is more aware and more prepared. But how do you, how do your agencies see their main tasks in over the winter, which we are told is the uh, more kind of dangerous period for uh, the, the virus and its effects? Peter first and then maybe we can move on to Shantanu. So firstly, um, so I think you're right, and there's quite a lot of uncertainty about how this will play out. It'll play out differently in different countries. And, you know, have we had the peak of the first wave? Are we going to get uh, a sort of second waves? Is it going to be sort of multiple waves? Um, and then eventually, how will this end? So will it be a sort of vaccine that kind of largely solves it? Or will it be a combination of better treatments, a bit of herd immunity, a vaccine that reduces deaths, perhaps reduces some of the impacts without solving it. And it may be that we have to live with this becoming endemic, but it has a sort of uh, dwindling impact over time. So a lot of it is unknown. So in a sense, I think we're sort of preparing preparing for scenario, you know, different scenarios rather than saying this is absolutely uh, what's going to happen and doing a bit of work to prepare for the kind of uh, more worst case scenarios. And I think it's largely doubling down on the areas that we spoke about. So there's sort of a global health, both the indirect impacts, but also uh, the vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics, trying to get others to contribute as well as ourselves. Um, I think the economic response will, will be very interesting. So, I mean, you could argue we haven't quite had the economic crisis that some of the most pessimistic scenarios were predicting, right? So, I mean, it's obviously really bad, uh, but but... There were more doomsday scenarios, uh, arguably. So the question is, both individuals and countries have less resilience uh, for further waves. So, I mean, that is uh, an issue that we need to be uh, prepared for uh, and kind of mitigating. Um, so I'd pick out the sort of, if I had to pick out a couple of things, the economic one, and then the sort of food insecurity that I don't think is fundamentally driven by COVID, but is exacerbated um, by that. And then I'll make a final point. I mean, in a sense, what I've tried to keep this about, you know, the, the developing world, because I think that it's more relevant, but, you know, we are thinking about how do we prepare for crises? So I think we're trying to be better at, uh, or even better at preparing for crisis, whether it's a pandemic or another crisis. So I think we've learned a lot about a crisis response. Um, and also there's the impact on kind of staff. Um, you know, we had to pull back a lot of staff uh, from a number of countries and we're putting them now back. And again, managing COVID is one of uh, a number of health challenges rather than seeing it as unique. Um, you know, is, is, an, is, an, is another aspect uh, as well. And then, you know, final point is can we use this to drive a greater interest in multilateralism and collaboration because no one country is going to uh, solve this on their own yeah thanks thanks very much uh shantanu uh uh, whereas, uh, that's uh, that's a great answer. It's, uh, there's very little for me to compliment there, uh, except to say that you know we need to keep galvanizing all of the support that we have to you know provide healthcare, to provide better nutrition, uh, so that so that you know uh, communities, disadvantaged communities, can actually. Uh, continue to do what they can in terms of, uh, you know, their jobs, etc., to feed themselves uh, and to become resilient uh, to the extent possible. I mean, the, the pandemic is here to 
to stay through the through the winter period. I completely agree, but uh, but we will need to work hand in hand, um, in a sense, in a multi-stakeholder manner, building strategic partnerships where we can uh, to try and see that somehow, uh, you know, the employment of of the rural poor, you know, etc., um, can can continue uh, to be to be increased, uh, so that you know. They can they can use their income to get better access to to healthcare, etc., and and deal with the pandemic uh, in a better manner than if they didn't have this. Well, can I just thank uh, Shantanu Mathu from uh, IFAD and Peter McDermott from the FCDO. Thank you so much for taking out the time and uh, speaking with us on on this ongoing crisis very insightful for us to be able to understand exactly how people in your position are dealing with that. Uh, thanks very much to uh, those of you who found the time to join us as members of the audience and for your questions. Uh, the next uh, se series is, the, well, the next sort of uh, webinar in the series uh, will be on COVID-19 and authoritarian populism in Brazil and India and uh, it'll either be on the 2nd or the 3rd of November. Uh, there will be notice uh, given once I have confirmation from the speakers. Thank you very much and uh, see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>